Welcome to episode 60 of the Operators Pod, brought to you as always by North Beam Fulfill and Sendling. Guys, we need the sponsors. They they pay for everything around here. Anyway, so uh, today's show, we are going to cover a handful of topics. We're going to talk about standing for something, right, on social and how that's impacting things. We are going to go into how to defend your time. Mike's got three really good tips at the very end of the show, so you got to stick around for those. And the most fun part of the episode, we're going to chat whether or not Hexglad should do a Super Bowl ad. So enjoy the entire well, an hour or whatever this is. This is a fun one. What's up, everybody? I use Fulfill. Fulfill is my ERP, my order management software. It does EDI for me. So what do all those things mean? Uh, If you are a small Shopify merchant, you probably hook your Shopify up to a 3PL or a warehouse, or maybe you're running fulfillment yourself out of your garage. We did that at one point. Orders come in, orders go out pretty easy. Where it gets difficult is when you're tracking multiple inventory sources so like different factories making the same stuff different costs different components coming in that ends up being a pain for accounting and then also different inventory sources going to customers so if you have three warehouses and it's not just going to shopify it's going to amazon it's going to wholesale it just ends up being a lot of different information to pass around and how do you make sure that runs smoothly without just throwing bodies at the problem that's what fulfill solves so it's an erp there's a couple ERPs in the industry. NetSuite is the big one. And ask anyone who's ever used NetSuite if they're happy, and they will say no. I am happy with Fulfill. We are using it. ERPs are a hard, messy business because it's so many different parties passing a lot of information, but it ends up being the nervous system of your entire company, right? Like if something fucks up on Amazon, I feel it because of Fulfill. So it's the ERP uniting everything. It also does EDI, right? So This is a little more technical, but Best Buy, Nordstrom's, all of these people, when they place orders, it's coming into your system via EDI, and nobody knows how that works. Like No 3PLs have it figured out. It is just an old, archaic system that I naively thought would take a week to set up, but no, it can take months to set up and actually test that it's working perfectly. Fulfill does all that. It sets up EDI integrations and then it stays with Fulfill. So you can switch warehouses, you can switch inventory sources without having to redo EDI integrations, which is the the death of a lot of companies. So if you're shipping stuff to people from multiple locations, eventually you'll need an ERP. I use Fulfill and I've been happy with it. They're a sponsor of the podcast. All three sponsors I personally use. So interact with Ridge and you will see how we're using these sponsors. So thank you, Fulfill. Talk to you later. Here's a question. How much of the like automated auto robo tipping is actually going to to the people? And how much of that just flows to the bottom line? Because I am super skeptical that that's making it to the employees. Mike, I'm so glad you brought that up. So there's been two cases that have blown up recently on Twitter. One was Bill Ackman. He was in a cab that was called by an Uber. And the, the cabbie said, Hey, don't tip. I don't get any tips on that app. And he did this huge blow up where like he, he, I mean, he has the the social clout where he like tagged founders of Uber, the CEO of Uber, and they're like, we're investigating it. And they're like, it was determined that they do get tipped just at the end of the week. Right. But the second one is subway franchises have been caught just t- stealing the tips and putting it on their bottom line. So, oh man, that it, is the worst it, of corporate America right there. Yeah, guys, 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 I've got it. Here's how we can juice our margins. What if, (laughs) and just stick with me here, what if we told people that these poor 16 year olds that are making our sandwich that you were tipping them, but we weren't actually giving them the money? We'll just give them like a foot long cookies instead or something. We'll take the money and our margins will explode. Well, Sean just mentioned a really, really special guy, Bill Ackman. So, and I, and I love this about Sean, because even though we don't talk about this stuff, we really do like fundamentally agree on a lot of the thing. If you don't, if, if you don't know who Bill Ackman is, you should know. That's all I'm saying. There's Here's the thing about like- Bill Ackman. Bill Ackman is actually taking the heat that comes with having some very public stances. Like 
They definitely have come after his wife, and it seems very like character assassination-y, very unfair. And so, and he has not relented. And that actually takes quite a bit of fortitude because once the other side decides they're gonna kind of aim all the all the the guns at you. So it's it's been pretty interesting to to watch him. Like I don't know that I agree with every take that he has, but I, he's obviously very smart. And the fact that he's been willing to, you know, like I, to me, he represents just we're in a different era where some things that you just wouldn't have said three or four years ago for, for fear of the backlash or that it, it wasn't politically correct or it didn't fit with the narrative. Bill Ackman is like, no, I'm just going to start saying it. And I do think that people like that have a catalyzing effect for all of the voices that feel marginalized or feel like, hey, I can't share my perspective because it's not in line with, you know, quote unquote, the current thinking. And so I've, I've been pretty impressed with him. But Mike, but Mike, you're absolutely right with everything you just said. However, people like Bill were shut down before Elon bought Twitter. There was no place for them to go or it was, it was infinitely more difficult. Like Joe Rogan could say stuff, and they like, but he 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 never kind of crossed that line where, I mean, just just so many really really um, strong voices were shut down by um, social media. Um, it's so, it's interesting on Twitter, Jason. To your point, they somebody did a, a, a research project on Twitter before Elon bought it, and if Twitter was a municipality it would have been the most liberal district in America is basically what they came up with. Like if you looked at the composition of people that were tweeting and that it would be, um, you know, more liberal basically than any place in America in terms of concentration. And then it certainly seems like that has swung, I mean, dramatically the other way since Elon bought it. It feels like if anything, it's, it now feels much more conservative than mainstream. Some of the views that are expressed Maybe, I don't think we've ever seen a platform shift so violently so quickly from one kind of ideology or, you know, line of thinking to another. Well, the all-in guys were saying that all the liberals went to threads, right, Sean? Well, I was going to say when Tumblr banned porn, that was probably when there was a big, a big cultural shift one way to the other. Uh, I, what I'll say is that there's, there's still plenty of, of uh, liberal and leftist discourse on Twitter. I mean, it's probably oh, yeah. the number one platform for it as well. It's just what I, what I think is happening is you're getting just a lot of different types of voices and it's not a mono monolithic echo chamber. I don't know anything Bill Ackman likes or I, the only thing I followed was, a. Uh, I know that he got into a huge fight with Harvard and then he attacked the, the Uber for stealing tips from Cabby. So the guy, the guy has a very wide breadth of political opinions, I can tell. But it's just good people can can talk and learn learn what other people think. Um, so it's great that both sides of the political spectrum can all gather on Twitter and they haven't bo- banned the porn yet, unlike Tumblr. <laughs> it's it's fascinating because in a lot of ways, what's going on with Twitter and with social media content, just content creation in general, is symbolic of a, a massive shift um, and a disruption that's happening in America. Like the universities are being disrupted, the content, the historical content providers are being disrupted. And obviously, like their business depends on them not being disrupted. And so it's interesting to watch, especially like you know, legacy media continue to try and control the narrative and hold on to the influence that they had 10 or 20 years ago. And it just isn't there. I mean, we know this, but a lot of the names that when you were, when I was a kid, I grew up and I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a good publication. That's a good magazine or whatever. They're basically just affiliates now at this point where they're they're just trying to find a way to put together content that will get some kind of monetization and so anyway like i i do think that we live in a world david perel if you if nobody has read this i'll just make a recommendation david perel wrote an article called what the hell is going on here and i think it was kind of his breakout moment but it really examines like how have things changed so dramatically? I read it in 2019, but it holds up really well. 
And it, it's basically about how the more monolithic kind of thought processes and messaging that our parents grew up with, and even we did in our, in our childhood, where everybody was basically watching the same things, thinking about the same things, that there were you know, a few agreed upon kind of perspectives on major issues, that that's all gone because of the uh, you know, just deluge of content and news sources from every different angle. And now... You know, it's, it's interesting thinking about this, even running a brand, that the customers that I serve, I serve customers that get their information and their perspective on the world from completely different sources. Like in the Trump trial, they showed, um, they actually asked people, like, where do you get your information from? Did you guys see this graphic? And they they took all the jurors and they showed where they got their information from. And I mean, it was wild. Some of these jurors, like they, they probably felt like they lived in a totally different co country than other ones because they were getting their information from just completely radically different sources. In some ways, this is what's interesting about e-com is that this hasn't actually happened with e-com. Like Amazon's reviews are still the gold standard and it's still this fairly monolithic unified perspective that that's where you go to find out about product quality. So we'll see if it if it disrupts ecom the way and, and products the way that it has every I mean I guess you can make the argument that influencers kind of disrupted it in the same a similar way. Well, I think unintentionally what's happening is I was thinking of this this weekend. Uh, unintentionally, what's happening is trust itself is being disrupted across many different categories now. So and I think that's where a lot of this like dissent comes from. And I'm with you guys. Like I will I love to see what Bill Ackman does simply because it's nice when somebody has an opinion, right? And we like, we move away from like everything looking the same and talking the same and walking the same. Cause I don't, I don't know that we move forward in business and society and anything without any kind, like with, without debate, without discourse. And like, you don't need to agree on everything. Like I'm sure if all four of us sat in a room for long enough and talked politics, we would find shit we don't agree on. Oh, dude, That's long fine. enough. Four <laughs> minutes on the episode. <laughs> Four and a half uh, minutes at family yeah. dinner at Thanksgiving. Well, this uh, is what's great about challenge. business is that business has like quantifiable metrics and performance where you can evaluate your e effectiveness. And I feel like that's much more difficult when we talk about things like how do you govern the country and stuff like that. There's a lot more, even, even then when you try and get quantitative and you try and look at data, both sides have their own kind of, you know, studies and perspectives that they share. Whereas with, with e-com and business, it's pretty simple. It's like, do you make a profit? Yes or no? Well, if not, then your perspective is not particularly helpful or valid here. Okay, Jason, Mike. do you? Oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Sean. I just, one, one thing to point out. Uh, Disney is worth $190 billion. TJ Maxx is worth $120 billion. So the retailer that you never think about, that there's like a big ass store that's empty in your hometown is worth like 60, 70% of Disney, the people who own Mickey Mouse and the fucking theme parks. So if you want to talk about a shift of culture away from publications and to commerce, that's a great example. That mm -hmm. is a fascinating, I, like it actually, I let me back up that example, Sean, of like this shift from media and culture into commerce. I actually think, I don't know about your feeds, but like when I go on social, I see it most in Jason's category, like in cooking and food. I'm just like, I'm just dominated by the variety of voices and the variety of content now in that space. It blows my freaking brain and it's I've really been thinking, I'm like, I wonder how much of this new wave of like, you know, hex clad is being driven by this disintermediation of like the food network, you know, 10 years ago, that's all my wife would watch, turn on television, turn, like put on the food network. It's like, whatever the five biggest chefs in the world were, that's the content you would consume in that category. Now, everybody I talk to has like a favorite TikTok chef or an Instagram chef or a YouTube chef. And it's, and they've all got like fucking 3 million viewers, 3 million subs, 5 million subs. Like the categories is wild. Well, and by the way, Sean, here's a number for you. Everyone's TJ Maxx is up uh, 110% over the last five years. Disney's down 22%. TJ Maxx is absolutely crushing Disney right. as a company over the last five years. And yeah. I think Matt has an interesting point. I think Jason's feedback was everyone has to eat. But I just want to talk about if this trend continues, it's like 
it's, so you're gonna have TJ Maxx buy fucking Disney and like give it another five years. TJ Maxx is worth three hundred billion dollars and Disney's worth a hundred billion, and it's like. I mean, they could just buy all of the IP, and then when you go to a Marshalls, it's just nothing but fucking Mickey Mouse ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> on this, on this oh, topic, we, guys, on this topic, guys of of media versus you know consumer or retail, I think you guys really struck a really good chord here, and we're very close with a couple of big media companies at Hexclad, and for sure, the senior execs at these places are trying to understand how to link selling products with their media more because as you as you know you see less fewer people watching tv you know fewer people watching linear um fewer people wanting to pay for subscriptions you're seeing that like for example fox's tubi is crushing it uh, one of the best net one of the best streaming services because there is no subscription price to it um, you're going to, you, you really guys really hit this one. It's, this is going to be really big in the next few years. Well, it's kind of interesting that, you know, forever the idea of how do you hit the most people possible with an ad, you would say Super Bowl commercial, and maybe that's still true, but, uh, it's actually interesting. If you look at TV and you look at the top hundred shows, Something crazy like 80 of them are NFL games. So basically, the one thing that hasn't been disrupted for whatever reason is the NFL. But outside of that, it's there just there isn't anything like the Super Bowl commercial anymore. There isn't this way where you can just say, hey, I'm gonna show something that hits a hundred million people or hits a massive swath of people. Everything is becoming more micro oriented. Like you said, find an influencer that align that that aligns with a part of your user base. Find a find a you know a political you know uh, commentator that aligns with a particular part of your base. Find little micro pieces and and speak directly to those people. But it's it's a much more it's that way. It's much more challenging. To kind of when you get to our level where you're talking about trying to build a you know a, a national or global brand, used to be for the Coca Colas of the world. It's it's just like you hit you hit like you said, Jason. You hit TV and you hit these really big audiences, but I don't think that works anymore. Okay, Mike, we got to talk about this. We got to talk about Super Bowl commercial. Okay, and here's one. Okay, this is an actionable conversation. Let's do it right now. I want to. I need all three of your opinions because I have a call. The answer is yes. I have a call with the Fox ad <laughs> sales team. They have the Super Bowl. <laughs> In February, okay, they have a Super Bowl in February. Should Hexclad do a Super Bowl commercial, and why? Matt, Here, what is first. your? Tell us about your demographic before we answer this, Jason. How this did, what is your internal? Yes. What does your internal stuff say about the who buys the pots and pans? Matt, Matt, Matt just Matt just said it. You cannot open any fucking social media app without seeing cooking everywhere. I know it's like. It's very lazy for me to say this, but we don't really think in terms of very tight demographic targets. Um, you know, there's an income level, obviously, um, but we're very 50, we're 50, 50 male, female, which is very rare for a business like ours. So we've got a very strong male bit. Um, and uh, so were you thinking more along the lines of gender or were you thinking more along the lines of age, Mike? Yeah, I was um, uh, both, but gender was the first thing that that popped into my mind. I mean, obviously, like the best Super Bowl commercial you can possibly do is beer because it's like so just on brand. And I'm trying to kind of think, you know, out of all those people that you're reaching, are you trying to reach them to be gift buyers? Are you trying to reach them because they're the buyer? Anyway, I'm starting there. All right, let's hear it, Matt. Matt was all over it. Matt was like, the answer is just it. yes. You have to spend, like, how many places do you have, Jason, to spend your marketing dollars to reach the eyeballs that a brand your size needs to reach to actually move the needle? Like, Mike was talking about this in a previous episode when it came to product categories and that, like, he can't enter a product category that isn't going to contribute, like, tens of millions of dollars in contribution profit to the business. I would say that where Hexclad is as a marketer, there are very few places that you could put a cannonball size of cash that can get you the reach that a Super Bowl ad can. There's just not many. It's also extremely high trust. Like the best brands in the fucking world are on the Super Bowl, guys. 
plus right. some dipshits I, 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 that run Matt, crypto like scams. Sean, let's hear from you. <laughs> it, yeah, it really just depends on what the bundle and offer looks like because it also it's like let's just whatever you spend on it we're gonna say it has a media value of zero dollars or like maybe a point one like you're not gonna get a ROAS out of this this thing right it is just to build brand awareness be cool be talked about you have the DNA to do it I'm gonna assume Gordon's gonna be in the ad now here's the challenge if it's on Fox how many other ads is Gordon going to be in that night? Because that's, I mean, he's going to have a new show. Like he has, he has the Vanderpump show right now. I cannot wait to watch that bad boy, but he's going to have a new show. And it's like, if they're going to promote that as well, I worry about the message being more diluted. So maybe you would, and, th- and then it's like, okay, how, are we going to get super fucking creative? Like remember when Tide was like, ran like eight commercials and they were all intersecting with each other. It's like, all right, that co- this is going to cost $35 million. So the creative scope is probably the most important. And then what the bundle looks like. If you don't want to do it this year, because it's going to cost you a minimum $10 million when you buy the ad space plus production. If you don't want to commit $10 million, I would run regional ads. I mean, people should know that like uh, linear TV has a certain number of spots for every single market that you can buy independently. And they could, you, you could run an ad during the Super Bowl for like 150 grand in Milwaukee or whatever, right? So they sell them regionally split out. You could test that. I mean, you're probably not worth testing at your scale. Like that's rigid 50 million or 100 million, not hex clad at $50 billion or whatever. Uh, so what I'll say is, you give me the creative brief, give me what the offer is, and I'll tell you. I'm probably 40% in favor right now, but it could go to 80. I'm 100%. I, was, yes. I, was, I love fucking the it. Sean perspective because typically Sean's perspective is like, if I don't see the attribution or have a straight line to attribution, don't do it. Um, so that's it's interesting to see the two. Okay, how about you, Mike? Man, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know. Hey, it's your money. So yeah, you should do it. I'd love to watch it. Uh, the, uh, it's easy. It's easy. Yeah. Can you just spend $30 million so that we can all learn from it, Jason? That would be yeah, awesome. Um, please. Yeah. If you guys want to kick it. in just a little bit to help us get us over the finish line. Yeah. So yeah, we'll do a GoFundMe. I, I, uh, I do think I thought your holiday commercial, Christmas commercial last year was brilliant. I thought it was great. And I would probably, if it was me, I would start by trying to hit NFL games in December with my holiday commercial at, as a way to kind of test. I would probably look at it as a two-year plan of like, what happens if I throw a couple million dollars at this market um, during a period where uh, the winds are more in my favor? I mean, February is not a particularly, it's not a time when people are primed to buy your product. So I would, I would actually start by trying it during a period where people are and in a period where you've shown you can just crush creative. Um, the, uh, because I, I think in general, Sean kind of mentioned this, but in general, like you pay a premium um, that has nothing to do with, you know, performance or, or anything else when you uh, do the Super Bowl. And that's okay. If your goal is, I, I guess the other thing would be, are you reaching a people that you just can't reach some other way? Um, and, or B, are you reaching them in a context in a way that you think you're more likely to be successful? I mean, there was, we grew up, I grew up at a time when everybody would talk about the Super Bowl commercials on Monday, you know, and I just, that's just not the world we live in anymore. Like, you know, a bunch of the times I don't even see them. I DVR past them. And, uh, it's just, it's just a different, it's a different universe. But I, I think the idea of NFL for you, certainly you're, you're adding a ton of different scope and, and you're, di- you're getting in front of a, a bunch of men, but that's what I do. I'd start with testing NFL in December games that matter. I'd pick a couple games that matter with major markets and I'd, I'd test there. And then if that went well, I'd, I'd look at it. What's up everybody. Welcome to the operators North beam ad unit. So 30 seconds, I'm going to tell you all about how if you have any problems with Northbeam, you can directly message Austin, the CEO. He is there. He will 
set up your ad account. He will make your bed. He'll give you cookies. Really, they have a dedicated team of people, probably 30, 40, 50 reps at this point, who will make sure Northbeam is working correctly and functioning so you can get amazing data out of this ecosystem. They will be more hands-on than any meta rep will ever be, and they're going to help you understand where your ad dollars are best spent, best positioned, and which ads are working. My team works with the Northbeam team literally every day. They're in my Slack. Maybe you don't get the same level of uh, support as an operator, but they will be there to make sure it's working. And if you're not happy at all, just email Austin. He will take care of you. We use Northbeam every day. It's a benchmarking tool. It's super helpful for forecasting, daily pacing, inter-hour pacing. So we can see like if we just launch an ad in two hours, if it's working or not. That's what Northbeam does for us. So thank you, Northbeam, for the support. I'm customer probably number one. So thank you so much. Well, one thing to add regarding Northbeam, because we just went through a contract renewal with them on their uh, specifically on the MMM. And uh, we got a pretty sweetheart deal, and I expect them to come back to us and raise our price, and they kind of deserve it. it I, I was like, let me let me reach out to the team, you know, and see how it's going, right? Because I'm not in the day to day. I get I get feedback, and the team was like, they have improved the MMM so much since we started it that they were like, we should definitely pay for this increase. So. And my team hates every agency and most SaaS. The, the only person that hates SaaS, uh, the only more than my team is Sean, Frank. Um, but yeah, I mean, they came to us. They're like, hey, you guys got the, the sweetheart deal. We wanted the first MMM clients. And I, I was very, very pleased when my team was like, it's really working well for us. So that's my little MMM plug. Jason, have you not run television ads and like major league baseball and a whole like you've done some pretty we've mass done, market we've done mlb TV. we've done nba we've done NFL. and they, were those I worth mean, the dollars all, um you know attribution is always tricky as we know but we, we we've seen certain certainly like at the right games massive site traffic right massive increases in site track traffic and we could do some incrementality looks at that and hold and just so yeah, we, what we, I'll say, we spend a lot on TV now. Like, I mean, we, we just we have. How, to, how much do you spend? What product. percentage of your budget do you spend on TV, Jason? That's still not a huge percentage, but it's like real numbers. Yeah, it, yeah. It's it's tough to look back and be like, did it work? Because the business has just been going directly straight up every single month forever. So it's <laughs> tough to be like, uh, did that TV money waste? I'm like, I don't know. Everything's kind of working, so maybe lean in. I just, the other perspective I have is you shouldn't let the tail wag the dog on this. Do the Super Bowl ad when you have something you want to tell to 100 million people. Because, like a new I product say, drop or something. Is that what exactly. you're saying? I had yeah. the same thought, Sean. That's like, if advice. you, especially yeah. if you had like some kind of, some kind of call to action, like you could easily make it work just on bringing back existing customers. Sorry, Sean, I'm stealing your thunder. No, no, dude. It's, it's, I mean, if you're just going to run the same message with the best cookware, it's like, I think that message has been seen by everybody in America four times, right? And like those people are in your funnel, but it's like when you're ready to drop ornamentation, when you're ready to drop limited collabs, like when you got the Kith X hex clad ready to go, or when you drop the Sub-Zero fridge, I've been trying to get you to make this whole time. Like when you have that, throw that in the background. 80% of the message is the, the classic, you know, it's going to convert 20% of that messages and we got new shit. So that's when I would do it. And if, if the timing works, the timing works. But if it doesn't work, I'd kick it off to next year. Good stuff. Well, shit. We'll that see. was fun. I like it. And it, it would make a great pod. Uh, <laughs> if you could just spend $30 million and then come back and we could all just like beat it up. That well, to be, be fair, it's, what a great, it's more like Sean's got the number. Sean's closer to the number. It's like seven plus production. seven to ten. In fact, if if you are just anyone, it's actually more than seven because you have to sort of double that in your overall spend. Um, like you have to commit to double that. Um, but for the right to buy, that? that's like that's like the whole thing is that like it's it's like Rolexes. Like if you want like the most important one, like it, go, it goes to the clients that we love and appreciate first, right? So I'm sure. Legacy brands get ad space for three million, but they spend seventy five million dollars across Q three when nobody else is buying TV. Mm. Um, that dude, I think it's so cool. Do it.
The answer is yes. <laughs> right. One of the other uh, interesting wrinkles is that the kind of uh, ad that you would put together likely for the Super Bowl wouldn't have a lot of cross applicability. I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? It, it seems like all the feedback that I hear, we have not experimented a ton with this is that the super high production stuff just doesn't work on social at all. Yeah. Well, it's really the big challenge is that Super Bowl ads have just become celebrity cameo things. And like, that's why they all feel uniform and not special. It tries to be like, we have this famous person and a funny thing happens and buy our product. And I think that can work great on social, but I think the real reason why you don't see it ported over is rights. <laughs> like if you have Tina Fey in your ad, you negotiate it for a Super Bowl, do you get rights for social? Like it probably just costs more money. So um, I would, I mean, I would try to bring a different creative approach. You already have the celebrity DNA, so I don't know what I would do. The creative is going to make or break it and you have a great team to work on that. But yeah, Mike's right. It's a one-shot asset. You're not going to run it the next year. <laughs> so that's hard. It's, it's funny because we're it's still using the same out. celebrities. We, we, um, it's a fun one. We I we have a really great creative team, um, both internal and and some external agencies we work with. Danny's really good at creative too. Like our you guys have seen our regular TV spot um, and and the the Gordon Holiday spot, which was a lot of fun. Was so um, good. You know that's Danny drives a lot of that. With we have a great head of content, Matt, and um, and then we have a couple of different agencies we work with. So we like our ability to do. I think we could do a killer ad. I think we would definitely would. Um, but yeah, question is: Is this just like is it ego, or you know, is it really uh, is the juice worth the squeeze? And well, uh, we got to figure it out pretty soon. Okay, Jason. Here's my creative pitch. You know, I love creative. I'm a creative guy, so. Uh, 30 second stakes with Gordon. You have a 30 second ad. There's a timer in the corner and he's like, I'm going to make a 30 second stake with my hex cloud. He's got, so he throws it down, he seasons it, then a flamethrower. And then he's like cooked perfect on my hex cloud grill or whatever eats it. So that'll be about two and a half million for my fee. So go ahead and just transfer that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not far off than what big creative agencies want for ideas. I'll tell you that. Yeah. We're in the Wait, wrong sorry. business guys. Hold we on. need to be in the idea Hold business, on. selling ideas. Can we zoom in on that for a second? I want to double click on that statement, Jason, The big creative agencies want how much? And can you give us your experience on that? Cause I don't, I don't think like I've not spent huge dollars on outside creative in my career. What have you seen yeah. as like, I don't think uh, Mike and Sean, I don't think you guys also spend huge money on creative with outside agencies. Like we've done performance stuff and that's pretty normal, but like Jason, what could you maybe just like, drop a little bit well yeah this is actually seen. um something where we spent a bunch of time recently regarding what is sort of the next step in in brand messaging for hexclad um we worked with a smaller creative agency in 2022 and 23 and they were excellent they were very much involved with our tv spot we did when we did the rebrand and the website in late 2022 just a really, really good team. They really got us and our marketing was very value prop focused because at the time it made sense. A lot of other noise in the cookware market and we knew we had the best product and we needed to tell people. But then it's like, okay, we've been doing that for two years, right? So what do we do? How do we level up? And, and so we did a huge like RFP process with like real big New York advertising agencies. And um, I will tell you to like work with them for a year to do just like an overall brand refresh plus you know all, all the all the messaging brand bible colors like the basic blocking and tackling and then and then camp some campaigns leading into like a big campaign with 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 a real tv spot this is probably to do it right multiple seven figures um so this is this is big money when you when you reach there. And we even thought like, are we ready for that? More like the question that I always ask, do we need to do this now? And I think we kind of maybe have got to the point with our scale that it is, it is worth it for us to spend the money. Um, it is painful though, <laughs> it's painful, but those are the kind of numbers. Like, I don't think you do anything close to that for under a, a million five with one agency in a year. And then 
there's probably a bunch of production costs on top of that. I think Mike has a great story where he's like, I mean, he told it last week. He's at the trade show. He's like, look, if we're selling this logo, we have a shot. If we're selling water bottles, we're fucked. Uh, and Jason, I mean, you know, this is like in back in time, was the rebrand worth it? I'm like, well, you're selling a logo and the logo is beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people have bought into it. So once again, it's, it sounds crazy to the, the D2C bootstrappers to be like, we're going to spend $1.5 million on colors. But like, it fucking worked. I mean, there's a reason why he's the biggest guy. Well, it's, it's asymmetric. You know, I mean, we've talked about this before. Like, the human brain doesn't really understand asymmetric things, but asymmetric things, when they, the, because of the fact that they can be 100x, 1000x when they work, then it totally just changes the math. And, you know, I think, I think brand is one of those categories where it's like, if you crush it, and it becomes an I I iconic household name. What is the brand equity there? Hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, billions of dollars, some kind of crazy amount. And so it's worth whatever it takes to get there. I, I do think we just, you know, Jason on a pod, I don't know, six months ago or something, uh, a year ago, you really were, were pushing me and I appreciated it to, that we should go through a brand you know, refresh, rebrand, something like that. We, we've we gone through a process. Uh, we ended up doing a combination of working with some people externally and doing some things internally. Uh, I, I would call it more of a brand refresh because we didn't change everything, but it's, it's going to be different and it's going to be better. Um, but one of the things that was interesting going through that process, and this is probably why it's so expensive, we talked to a bunch of different people that were referred to us. We, I, I went out there and got a lot of recommendations. And one of the most common things we heard from people was, oh, it's so nice to talk to a brand that's not struggling for once. And this is part of the reason why these agencies can be so expensive because usually people are coming to them as the Hail Mary. Things aren't working. Comps are down. We're going the wrong way. We've got a new management. You know, uh, we're, we're being really pushed to, to switch things up, to freshen up the brand because it's not working. And they're, they're able to charge higher prices as a result because... Um, people are fairly desperate. And obviously when Hexclad did it, when we did it, we're, we're doing it from a, a position of strength where we don't, you know, we don't feel desperate. But I, I think that dynamic is very real in the, the brand, you know, agency brand space. Mike, I just want to say that influencer deals are the same way, right? Like a lot of brands who are going out of business or sales are down, they look for a big influencer deal to save them, this big Hail Mary. And when, it, when we did the deal with Marquez, it was refreshing to, for him to hear like, oh, the business has grown 50% every year for the past five years and everything is perfect. And I could just come and be a little bit of rocket fuel on this. He's like, fantastic. I'll do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Hail Marys don't really work. <laughs> like, yeah. There's in good to great. It, they talk about this extensively that this is like, this is what companies that, that don't do well do. It's like you get a new outside CEO. He comes in with his big idea and his Hail Mary, and then that doesn't work. And then that leads to another big idea that that doesn't work. So you get another new outside CEO. It's a cycle that a lot of companies fall into. And if you're struggling, it's rarely, the, rarely the right answer is some big bet the farm, you know, idea. Yeah, we, we hear about the times it works. The FedEx CEO going to Vegas and, and gambling, right? You don't hear about like the 80,000 plumbers who've had the same issue and they go to Vegas and they lose it all. So <laughs> we like the, the Holy Mother Hail Mary, it's like this glory of like throwing this pass and like, oh my God, we won because of it or whatever. And it's it just never happens. You're way better just incrementally focused on getting slightly better. Well, and I have a theory about that, that it's capitulation is what it actually is, is that a lot of times people get to the point where they're like, I'm so frustrated and I'm so sick of this that I want to throw a Hail Mary because I know that if it doesn't work, I'm done. And that's as appealing as the idea that it's going to work, you know, just like to have some finality because it's a grind. And like we, you know, we've talked to people that people that listen to this are all across the spectrum of where they're at in their business. I've talked about this before that. I don't really listen to anybody's advice who hasn't been through a big up cycle and a big down cycle. I've put companies in the ground and I've scaled companies up. And I think that that, you know, it changes your perspective. But just like Sean's saying, you know, Hail Marys, that they're they're almost never the right the right answer. One of the reasons why we can say to Jason, hey, yeah, you should maybe do a Super Bowl ad. 
is you know what? Hexcloud can make a $10 million mistake. They're at a scale where they can make a $10 million mistake and they can eat that and still be really successful. And so, I, you know, maybe that's the most compelling reason why you should do it, Jason, is that you, you've earned the right to be able to take big swings like that and miss because of the, the scale of the business you built. What's up, everybody? I use SendLane for all of my email needs. They have SMS, they have reviews, they have all that stuff. But the big, scary, hard thing to do is to switch from Clavio to SendLane. And I'm telling you, I did it. They just rolled out a new feature where you do not have to pay for SendLane until you're up live sending emails on Clavio, essentially de-risking the change off period, right? We kept Clavio up and live for probably three months during that, that transition. And now you can do that. You can move at your leisure, make sure things are set up and working, make sure they have the features you want, and only start paying when you're actually fully fo- fully live on SendLane. So if you're sick of the Clavio, Clavio monopoly, if you're sick of rates going up and bad customer service and everything that Clavio has been doing for about fucking five years, uh, check out SendLane. They are the they are the modern, fast moving email startup. So e commerce focused, hyper focused on winning over Shopify customers, and they know what makes us uh, money on email for Shopify. So check them out, SendLane. I use them. If you got an email from me, it's coming from SendLane. Let's hear. So uh, we should go back to the deliverables of the branding agency. So let's just say, I'm going to say it was $2 million. You said, you know, multiple seven figures. I think you think it was a good value. I mean, the business is beautiful and doing fantastic. So what is actually delivered? And I can share my experience. We've only ever spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on videos and assets working with like a raindrop, but I can tell people how it's different than like a UGC agency. But like, what is, what is the big difference from them and like a narrative or a tube science or whatever else? So when we did it the first time, we didn't spend seven plus figures. Well, if we had the TV commercial, maybe we did. But like the general brand refresh from, we start out with consistent messaging everywhere. So from the website to our packaging, to our inserts, to our email look and feel, right? Really getting that all right, developing the correct color palette, the fonts, and turning that uh, the value propositions for the business. We like went deep, deep, deep uh, on all that. Um, and that you, I think you can do that for like 50 K actually, but then you, you layer on campaigns on top of that. Um, you, you start to get multiples of, of that. So, but with, with respect to like the, the large creative agencies, they just like are literally doing the same thing um at multiples of the price um and that was really the conundrum that we had like are we gonna we're doing the same thing at like 4x the pricing because these people are supposed to be the best and um i'm not i'm i'm really not sure to be honest whether it's whether it's worth the money um but what you get really is um it's it's almost the same with with both the big guys and the small guys um i will say that when you bring in like a high power agency they've got a lot of really smart people and you know the first agency that we hired who was excellent worked with them for two years and we still work with them when they got us and like the hair was standing up on the back of our necks like when we had the conversation about how we want to position our brand and then we talked with you know two years later like five big agencies and um you know there was really the one that came up with a really killer idea for how to talk about our brand uh over and above value props but really from an overall like brand messaging like think about like seminal brand campaigns that you've seen that's what we wanted to do like like everyone well, i'm thinking i mentioned on the pod like mastercard right priceless um there's a few of those campaigns that are just like so what we were trying to do is to find someone who can pitch us on what might be that next priceless campaign. And we just found one agency that that like they did something that was really compelling. And it was like, all right, well, if we want to do this, we sort of, you know, this is just like 
what it costs and, and we're going to do it. So it's not that scientific, but I mean, that's just kind of like the way these things go. Yeah. I think you, you said something that I, I really resonate with that, you know, we work with raindrop and I think raindrops like a hundred to $300,000 per video. Like it's really expensive to get those videos done. And like, what's it between raindrop and a 5,000 or 15,000 or $50,000 video? Like what's the big difference? And at the end of the day, it's, it's people <laughs> like all you're paying for is people, ideas, scripts, and then shooting like for, the four of us could do it right now for $0, right? Uh, the difference is they're just better at writing, right? Like the raindrop team just has people who's, who have won Emmys writing for comedy shows. So they're just funnier, right? Like they know how to structure things. They know how to get a laugh. They know pacing. Um, so you're really just paying for better people or, or more experienced people. And what's crazy is it can go from literally $5,000 for video idea and concept shot to 5 million. <laughs> it's the only difference there is people. So, uh, just shop around, I guess is my, is my big piece of advice for listeners it's the locksmith thing the guy does two minutes of work charges you 250 dollars, and people are like 250 dollars for two minutes it's like no man that's 25 years like that whole story yeah exactly it's every profession is like this creative is no different that's a muscle some people have just been exercising that muscle a long ass time and they're really good at it like me so yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly um Shit, where do you guys want to go from here? I like this. Well, I liked Sean's idea. If we're getting crazy here, I liked Sean's idea of talking about bad cold emails for a minute just because it's funny. But if we want to do something <laughs> more substantive, we can talk more about, about Sean's triad or the consumer. What do you guys want? To I do? think we could we should save the, the resilient thing for another episode. It's probably a whole episode. Um. I, what's the cold email thing? Did I miss a, a shitty I call? Just, dude, I get the fucking worst cold emails. One, I have two first <laughs> names. So Sean, Frank, right? I get emailed been like, hey, what's up, Frank? All the time. <laughs> like, and uh, I got a cold email and they said, hey, dude, love. And then it was a, it was a competitor's brand. And then they were like, would love to pitch you on some software. <laughs> and I was just like, dude, not only did you get my first name wrong, not, not only did you get my brand wrong, it's like something I have no fucking interest in. So, I mean, every day I probably get a hundred cold emails for some, oh, yeah. some piece of bullshit. And if anyone's listening and being like, oh, I sent Sean an email, I sent him a DM, he doesn't fucking get back to me. You're competing with a hundred random scammers, right? So like, they're all just getting marked as spam. So I'm just curious, like, you know, the one, the worst piece of cold email you ever got that you can remember. And then two, if someone actually wants to get a hold of you, what is like the the one surefire way to do uh, it? Besides so I'm your not gonna I'm not gonna go for the worst one. I'm just gonna literally go for the one that came in at 7:48 a.m. and I haven't had time to delete yet. By somebody called the Merchant Fund, and it says, "Jason, I hope you're doing well and feeling good for the holidays." So what <laughs> holiday are we at? <laughs> and then I wanted to reach out regarding multiple applications we received on your behalf, asking us to price out a funding approval for your business. Mm -hmm. What is this? Man, <laughs> when I was, when we first started the company, 2016, I think I put my cell phone on a Dun and Bradstreet application or something. And, you know, I will regret that decision for the rest of my life. Like this is why, okay, so I'm going to just give away some alpha to everybody listening to the show. Okay, I'm going to give you three really actionable things, uh, two actionable things. The first is if you have an iPhone and if you don't, really, what are you doing? If you have an iPhone, <laughs> I want you to go into settings and go into phone and you can tell it to silence unknown callers. And what that does is anyone who calls you that's not in your phone book, you won't even see it. And so you go, if you're not in my phone book, you go to voicemail automatically. And if somebody who's not in my phone book call is going to call me, I turn that feature off for five minutes. I take the call and then I turn it back on. So I don't even see it. I don't even see it when those call a second one, you go into your Gmail and you create a, a filter. And here's what you two different filters you want to create. The first one is if the word unsubscribe is anywhere in the email, it goes to a special folder, your unsubscribe folder that you never look at and you just empty every so often. So that's going to knock some of this trash out. Second filter, 
I want you to put the words quick question in there. And if it says quick question, it goes directly to the quick question incinerate folder. There, I just I just took 70% of this off your plate. You're welcome. That's hours a week of somebody's time that you just gave them back. That's right. Like, I'm single-handedly three. fighting the good fight. I as as Jeff Skilling would say, I'm on the side of angels in helping you fight spam. <laughs> I've actually had a cold email, guys, where the, the person emailed me and they thought they were emailing my competitor. <laughs> I shit you not. And I'm like, how'd you fuck that up? No, it's like, not even the wrong company, in the right, but like genuinely, you, e- like you thought I was somebody else. But John, I like how you link this to getting in touch with people because this is something that actually stresses me out. I feel really bad like that I don't get back to people or I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm being a douche or I'm, I feel like I'm important and don't want, I really do try to get back to people. And, and there are a lot of people who've come and gone through the Hexclad sphere or, or, or through my life sphere who like, you know, just, we all get busy and there's just so much to quote my surface area for this, right? Like I just don't, and it's, it, it, it stresses me out. It actually makes me feel bad because like I, I care about that. I care about that reputation. And it's just like, it's a, it's a fucking fire hose. And I, I really, I'm almost, I've almost given up on Slack. <laughs> like I know that Sean runs his whole business on Slack. Um, we just started using another, like, I think we went from Monday to click up or something. And like, everyone's doing that now. And it's like, I've just literally told everyone if it's really important, you know, just text me. <laughs> I haven't got it. It's just too much. Okay, so I've got another. Here's the worst. The worst one, and I've gotten this multiple times. Hey, Mike, would love to hop on a call and tell you about our software in exchange for your time because we know it's valuable. We're, we would love to offer you a free custom Yeti Tumblr. You're <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm that like, is so good. <laughs> and so, so like, I, I have a rule that I just, I'm keeping it positive. I'm not punching down on social media. So in this case, I'm like, I don't care. I'm posting it. So I post it, you know, and and people are like kind of roasting this person for good reason. And then somebody's like, well, that's not cool. And I'm like, why is it not cool? And they're like, well, you're, you know, you're, you're calling them out or whatever. And I'm like, well, you got to look at it from my perspective. This person is using some robot to steal a little bit of my time. Right. People like, and this is the thing that you feel when, you know, you run a business like Simple Modern or any of you guys, like people are constantly nibbling away at your time and making bids for your time, which is your most valuable resource. Right. And it is just offensive when somebody makes a bid for my time with zero regard for being helpful or for actually learning about my business when I'm just a name on a list. And so if you treat me like a name on a list, like this is why you get so much frustration and antipathy from people like us towards this. If you're a SaaS vendor, like, I'm sorry, but this is where it comes from is that like it adds up and it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. I have to delete a thousand email, even with my filters, I have to delete whatever, like Sean said, I have to delete a thousand emails a week. And those take a little bit of time. And th- those are those are minutes I never get back. And a lot of that is people being like, I can help you quadruple your Amazon business. And it's like, you don't even know what you're talking about. Right? Like, anyway, so it, it's very frustrating. I think we've said this before, but it's worth saying again. If you want our time, here's the way that you do it. You get a warm introduction from somebody who knows us. You make it very clear at the front what you're looking to get out of the interaction. We understand that anytime we talk to somebody that they want something like nobody ever wants to just talk and that's okay. Like it makes sense. But the more upfront you are with what your ask is and what value you're hoping to get out of it, the better. And then you better be bringing value on the other side because, you know, there's a thousand people who would love to get value from us. We need to find people where it's reciprocal. And this isn't being selfish. This is just being like smart and not getting bled dry. Mm. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a shame that networking is the most important thing you can do for your business as a CEO, like not just in a sales capacity, just like talking to other people helps you get better and understand what to do. 
it's also the worst thing because you end up just getting pitched non fucking stop. Like I was just at Commerce Summit and like great brands love talking to them, but like you'll find yourself walking out of the bathroom and then you'll find yourself in a corner of being like, <laughs> "Hey, you actually need my thing right now. You should you should buy it. give me your email actually." Uh, Sean is defenseless at the urinal. If you if you attack him there, you can pitch your influencer software. Dude, I've been pitched. I've been pitched the worst places. Like walk out of a party waiting for my uber someone's like this is no joke someone's like hey how can i tell you how can i get you on parker <laughs> like some credit card and it's like dude you look I, I gotta go man <laughs> it's marketers who learn how to sell things or salespeople that learn how to sell things by going to a like an nfl game or a basketball game you ever notice that they always sell beer on the exit from the men's hmm. bathroom yeah, i'm like it's brilliant I'm like, dude, everybody going in there to go to the washrooms, coming out, buying another damn beer. I thought it was the most brilliant thing ever. I'm like, that's marketing one-on-one. It's where they learn. Well, here's, here's an interesting thing like that I've learned. And listen, I worked in a, a nonprofit ministry where I had to be highly initiative. And so anybody who's out there being highly initiative and putting themselves out there, like, listen, I respect the hustle. And, and I appreciate it. Like when people come to my door trying to sell me window treatments or, you know, whatever pest control, I always talk to them because I'm like, listen, this is hard. And, and I actually really like respect the hustle. But something that that is counterintuitive that that people need to know is that there's a point. It's like a it's if you graphed out like the returns from hustle, it's it can be like a uh, like a hill where once a, after a certain point, it just becomes annoying and it starts to be a negative signal like that stri- being strategic in how you hustle is how you get effective results, right? So like, th- this is a perfect example. It's not, can I send out 10,000 cold emails? It's, can I send out a hundred good cold emails, right? Like that's way more effective than just having some, you know, Chinese AI spam bot go after a bunch of people's inboxes. I, I would love to see like what the response rates are on some of this stuff. It can't be good. I mean, you guys mentioned the funding stuff. Gosh, when the freaking ERC was going on, ERC is another thing that fortunately, I don't know if you, you know, you want to have a Gmail filter for that, but like that, I don't, I bet I got a thousand people trying to do the ERC thing with me. Did you guys get hit up with that all the time? Yeah. What's, dude, what's ERC? I just, yeah. So in America, it was employee retention credit. If you didn't oh. fire people, you got some money or something. Yeah. You want to hear some bullshit, guys? I didn't do it because it's like our business grew during it. So it's like, okay, like, you know, we we didn't think we qualified or whatever. Everyone just did it. And then the IRS just said, okay, you can keep the money. <laughs> I just lost a million, two million fucking dollars because I, I tried to not do fraud i tried to do the right fucking you, you, thing you, you tried it, to apply common sense is what happened sean and that and when it comes to money that is not how it works in this country at least yeah, not a so governmental bu- level yeah i i fucking just lost out on free money because i was trying to do the right thing so fuck all that COVID era bullshit <laughs> that's what i got to say uh you guys want to you guys want to end it on that i love it <laughs> <laughs> That's what the a, mic drop. Fucking exclamation good, point. Good mic drop, Frank. Yeah. I'm going to start calling you Frank. <laughs> yeah. Frank. Hey, Frank. <laughs> hey, Mike, I'm going to send you some Yetis, dude. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. Well, you already drink out of them during the show. Just send me one of the ones you drink out of. Dude, oh. I, 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 this is what I already said, dude. I've spent more money on Simple Modern than anyone on this call. No, I've you literally... guys, you guys are awesome, actually. Like, I'm, I'm just giving you guys a hard time. You guys are 10,000 awesome. bottles in my warehouse. All right. Bye, everybody. All, All right. right. See you guys. Okay. That's a wrap. As always, thanks to our sponsors, North Beam, Fulfill, Sendlane. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please go badger Jason on Twitter so that he does do a Super Bowl ad so that all of us can actually learn something from it. Uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in. If you have not subscribed, please go subscribe. YouTube, Spotify, wherever you are digesting this show, we appreciate it. Thanks again.